And our next presenter will be Dr. Nala Sivam Palisami from the Henry Ford Health Institute. And uh, he has an excellent presentation ahead of us, combined immunohistochemistry and RNA-ish to elucidate tumor molecular heterogeneity in prostate cancer. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Nala Palisami. Um, Today I will be talking to you about the application of combined immunohistochemistry and RNA in situ hybridization to study the molecular tumor heterogeneity in prostate cancer. So in this presentation, I am not going to overwhelm with uh, any data. So what I'm trying to do is I will just share my experience uh, because I'm one of the early adapters of this technology, both rna -ish and uh, combined uh, IAC and rna -ish. So I would like to share my personal experience in uh, setting up uh, this technology in my lab. Then I will show you how successfully we have used this uh, approach uh, to understand the molecular uh, heterogeneity of prostate cancer. <clears throat> The outline, uh, I don't have any disclosure uh, to do, so I'm not working for uh, ACD Bio or Biotechni, so I don't have any personal disclosures um, or conflict of interest. So the outline of my talk <coughs> is going to be, first uh, I will show you uh, how uh, comparable the RNA in situ hybridization with the traditional immunohistochemistry, <coughs> because uh, I think this will be helpful for um, any a new lab that they are trying to set up this RNA in situ hybridization technology. Because my actually aim is to actually share my experience to the um, laboratory people who are interested in actually setting up this technology for the first time in the lab. And also I'm sure it will be useful for some people who have already uh, have been using this technology. So whatever that I'm presenting in this uh, <clears throat> in this lecture is going to be not restricted only to prostate cancer, since I have been uh, kind of primarily working on prostate cancer, but it is quite adaptable uh, to other uh, solid cancer or any type of cancer as well. So, so initially, first I will show you how comparable the RNA in situ hybridization technology is uh, comparable with the traditional immunohistochemistry. Then I will show you how we can actually use the RNA in situ hybridization to detect some of the AIDS gene fusions in prostate cancer. Because we have to use only RNA AIDS because for some of the genes we don't have any good antibody. So we were the one first uh, we used the RNA in situ hybridization for detecting this gene fusion prostate cancer. So I will show you some of the publications as well. Then using this combined approach, I will show you how we identified a distinct uh, molecular subsets of prostate cancer. Then uh, by successfully using this approach, <clears throat> uh, we used uh, this technique to study the um, tumor molecular heterogeneity in prostate cancer by preserving the cell morphology, by, by doing the in situ analysis. So like uh, traditionally people do next gen sequencing, by taking uh, samples from different areas of the tumor, then do the sequencing, they look for copy number changes, mutation, other things. But this is a powerful approach where, can, where you are not biased with the cell, tumor selection, you will be able to analyze the tumor as it is. So I will show you some good examples how we successfully use this. Then uh, since uh, the RNA in situ hybridization is a powerful approach, uh, this, is, uh, this will be very useful for the detection of non-coding RNAs uh, for in-situ analysis, because non-coding RNAs, obviously, we cannot develop any antibodies. So I think for the in-situ analysis of non-coding RNA, I think RNA is, is a very powerful approach. So I will show you some examples how we use that. And then at the end, I will quickly show you, <clears throat> uh, you can also use uh, the DNA fish, that is a traditional uh, two-color um, or single-color uh, fish technology that can be combined with rna -ish so that you'll be able to detect um, both the DNA copy number and also the RNA expression simultaneously for the gene of interest. Because sometimes you will see the gene amplification, but uh, the question will come, 
even though that gene is amplified at the DNA level, is it really expressed at the RNA level? So if you have that type of question, you'll be able to answer that question uh, simultaneously by doing the DNA fission RNA ish. So with that, <clears throat> uh, in, this, in this slide, I want to actually give uh, some tips uh, based on our experience. I thought this will be very useful for uh, the people who are trying to uh, establish this technology for the first time uh, in your lab. So this is mainly for combining both IHC and RNA-ish. So particularly when you are uh, planning to do RNA-ish, make sure you use freshly cut uh, tissue sections uh, for FFPE. Uh, it is okay to have the blocks as it is, but when you cut the slides, make sure it is fresh. And then uh, even if you cut before, uh, make sure they are stored uh, at a good temperature like minus 20 or minus 80. And uh, if you have already, if someone is providing you the already cut slides, make sure that they are not older than three months. Sometimes, even if they are older than three months, you will see the signals, it may be working, but the quantity and the quality may be compromised. And you may not uh, see the actual uh, tissue level expression, so make sure that you use the fresh uh, slides. Then uh, before uh, doing the ISC and um, RNAs, make sure that you use the positive control probes to make sure the RNA integrity is preserved. <clears throat> uh, I think there are some good uh, positive control probes uh, that are uh, available. Then um, <clears throat> the other important point is uh, people may be wondering, because if, they are, if you are trying to use it in the clinical lab, uh, both uh, manual and automated methods can be used for doing the RNA in situ hybridization. So I think uh, the automated methods like uh, I think DACO or the Ventana systems can be used uh, for the automated analysis. But uh, the manual um, procedure also working equally well. Then another important point that I would like to <clears throat> mention is um, if you are doing the multiplex uh, uh, assay, make sure uh, you want to test each probe individually first, make sure they are working before engaging the dual uh, um, approach. And uh, other important point is when you are doing both ISC and RNA is on the same slide, make sure you do the RNA is first before doing the immunohistochemistry. Uh, but you cannot do the other way around. Don't do ISC first, then RNA is, uh, because that will kill all the RNA. You may not see anything like that. But one good advantage is if you do the RNA ish, there is no need for doing the secondary pretreatment and antigen retrieval and all those things. Whatever the pretreatment that we are doing for RNA ish, that is more than sufficient for the immunohistochemistry. And uh, like I mentioned before, DNA fish and RNA is can be performed on the same tissue. The other important point is, it is important when you are doing both ISC and rna ish you have to have some prior knowledge about the expression pattern of the marker, because some may be nuclear, some are cytoplasmic, or some are membrane. Make sure that if you are doing two markers, say like two markers for IHC, <clears throat> If both are expressed in the nuclear, you may not be able to solve it. So make sure like one is cytoplasmic or membrane, the other one is nuclear, like that, so that you'll be able to distinguish the expression pattern. I think these are, I, I thought these are all some of the important uh, key uh, things that uh, you want to keep in mind before setting up the experiments. And if you have any other technical issues, uh, feel free to contact me or uh, the ACD Biotechnical Support. They have been excellent in uh, troubleshooting your issues. So with that, uh, I would like to jump into <clears throat> the, um, the data. So this presentation, I'll be primarily focusing on um, uh, prostate cancer, uh, how successfully we use this uh, approach for studying prostate cancer. So like I mentioned, this is not limited only to prostate cancer. If anyone is interested, you'll be able to use for other cancer type as well. So as you know that prostate cancer is the uh, is uh, kind of well characterized, well studied at both at the genome and at the expression level, and uh, it was only the prostate cancer was the first kind of solid cancer which was identified to have some recurrent gene fusions like the TMPRSS2 gene fusions and other its family genes, and I was involved in the discovery of BRAF and other gene fusion which I will show you in the next slides. 
So I'm going to use uh, these important prostate cancer specific biomarkers, how we can actually study in depth for the expression pattern of these genes and how to understand the tumor molecular heterogeneity of prostate cancer. So as you know, these are the, some of the markers uh, that are known to be kind of recurrently rearranged in prostate cancer, like the TMPRSS to herd gene fusions, then the SPINK1 overexpression, P10 deletion in about 30% of the prostate cancer, then ETB1, ETB4, and ETB5 gene fusions, and PCA3, PCAT1, and SLAP1. These are the well-characterized non-coding RNAs. Then recently, we showed uh, the recurrent gene fusion involving the KLKP1, which is a pseudogene that is forming a gene fusion uh, as well. So these are the well-characterized prostate cancer-specific molecular biomarkers. So <clears throat> either uh, you can study these markers individually just by using uh, by IHC or by RNAs if the antibody is not available, or you can actually uh, detect more than one marker simultaneously. Okay, so here in this presentation, what I'm going to show is either you can actually visualize these markers individually or three or four markers simultaneously in the single hybridization. So I will show you how we are doing it. By doing that, we have a good understanding about the molecular heterogeneity of the prostate cancer. So the first, uh, like ERG, uh, P10, and SPINK1, there are good antibodies are available, and they are well, uh, well characterized, and it is published in several papers. So you can easily perform uh, um, IHC, either individually or you can combine, like ERG and P10. You can do, because ERG is nuclear, P10 is cytoplasmic, or ERG and SPINK1, ERG is nuclear and SPINK1 is cytoplasmic. So you can do it either as a single color IHC or as a dual IHC, that can be done. But for ETB1, ETB4, and ETB5, there is no good antibody. Okay, although there are many antibodies that are being uh, sold in by different vendors, but none of those antibodies are specific uh, for cancer. <clears throat> if you do it on the tissue, you will see them staining all over. Okay, they, they are not cancer specific like the ERG antibody. So it may work well on the Western blot, but on the tissue, they are not good for in situ analysis. So that's why we developed the uh, RNA ish method uh, for visualizing ETV1, 4, and 5. Then obviously the PA, PCA3, PCAT, and SLAP, uh, these are all, and the KLKP1, these are all non-coding RNAs, and the KLKP1 is a pseudogene. So these can be detected only by RNA. Yes, you, there is no, since these are all non-coding RNAs, there is no antibody available. And uh, <clears throat> finally, what we did was we will be able to combine ERG, SPINK, ETB1, ETB4, like you can do all the four markers simultaneously in a single hybridization. Uh, so by doing, why we are doing this and what we learn out of this, that I will show you in the subsequent slide when we move to that, uh, those slides. So first, <clears throat> to begin with, since uh, we spent a lot of time initially to set up this technology in our lab when the ACD bio was new, that was in the 2000, uh, I think eight, uh, nine, or ten. Uh, in, the, in those days, the technology was not uh, well perfected, or it was not quite popular. So we were one of the early adapters, and uh, I thank uh, ACD Bio, a technical team. In fact, some of them they came to my lab and they helped me to set up this uh, assay. So here I will show you uh, how comparable the RNA in situ hybridization uh, is. Uh, comparable with the immunohistochemistry. Okay, I'm going to show you just one example. Uh, so here before, like I said before, when, before you do any of this RNA in situ hybridization, make sure you test those slides uh, with the control probe. So here we did uh, the Paul uh, R2A as a control probe, make sure the RNA uh, integrity is high so that uh, then you use the positive and negative control to make sure they're working. So on the same tissue, what we did, so we took a case that is known positive for the ERG gene fusion. So this is the ERG immunohistochemistry that shows uh, the nuclear staining only in the cancer, not in the stroma or in the benign tissue. So we took a consecutive slide from the same patient and we did the RNA in situ hybridization using the ERG specific probe. As you can see, the staining is specific 
highly specific only in the tumor area like the IHC. You don't see anything in the stroma or in the benign. So it is S or no. It is not like you're not looking for differential between the benign and the cancer. Okay. So I think that is the beauty of this ERG gene fusion expression because these uh, genes are expressed only after the chromosome translocation. So there is no endogenous level of uh, ERG expression in the benign tissue. It's only when there is a chromosome translocation, the ERG gene is activated by um, androgen responsive elements and it gets overexpressed. So this is a good example to show that, you know, both the RNA and the RNA ancient IHC is quite comparable and uh, you'll be able to <coughs> visualize um, the tumor uh, without uh, <coughs> any ambiguity, okay? So next one. So I think based on uh, like uh, several uh, kind of uh, samples that we have analyzed um, uh, using this uh, uh, rna ace method, so we came up with a kind of a scoring system because you will see Sometimes the genes are expressed at different level, uh, whether it is a low or a high expression. So we have a, a kind of a scoring system. When it is negative, it's like zero. <clears throat> or when it is um, like uh, when you're seeing the varying pattern, uh, based on the intensity, we, we give a different grade, like one plus, two plus, three plus. Because the beauty of RNA is, is you will be able to visualize individual mRNA transcript as like a distinct punctate dots. So every dot represents the messenger RNA molecule that we are seeing it. So depending on the level of expression, you will see the different intensity changes. So next I will show you how we use this RNA for the detection of Earth's gene fusions uh, in prostate cancer. So as you know, uh, I think with the discovery of the Earth's family gene fusion in prostate cancer, this is for the first time we will be able to classify the prostate cancer into distinct molecular subtypes. So we have uh, Earth's fusions uh, uh, combined together with uh, account for about 50% of prostate cancer, then SPINK1 in about 10%. Of Caucasian and about 30% in African American. Then I was involved in the discovery of the RAF kinase gene fusion prostate cancer, which uh, which are present in about one to two percent of the prostate cancer. And recently, some of the non-coding RNA targets have been identified. So this, for the first time, we were able to classify the prostate cancer into distinct molecular subtypes. So. The other interesting uh, thing is uh, these uh, molecular markers of the gene fusions, they are not associated with any particular gleason grade. Like ERG gene fusion, you will find even in high grade PIN or uh, gleason 6, 7, 8 on all the, all the stages, and like the other markers also. So it is important that uh, just by looking at the morphology alone, it's not helpful for uh, kind of uh, to decide uh, the risk factors or the prognosis of the disease. I think combining this molecular evaluation helps <clears throat> uh, to assess uh, the risk uh, for recurrence of the disease and other things. So it is not only that these markers uh, are important. Recent uh, work, the, some of the preclinical work clearly show that there are some therapeutic drugs can be developed uh, targeting this gene fusion. So some of these drugs, uh, although they are not available for uh, prime time clinical use, but they are uh, they look promising that uh, some of the preclinical studies that clearly shows that they have a potential like for uh, the raf kinase uh, gene fusions and there is already sorafenib for the mec inhibitors so there are already fda approved drugs are available so that can be used as well so given this importance of these uh, markers <coughs> so we need to have a robust system for uh, testing uh, the tissue samples for the presence or absence of this gene fusion. So in that regard, uh, I think we need to have a very reliable and a robust method for the detection of the gene fusion. So every time you don't have to do PCR or next-gen sequencing, we can have, even if we have a small biopsy tissue, that can be easily assessed by doing this IAC and the rna -ish, which I will show you how we can do that. <clears throat> so these are uh, some of the probes uh, that are uh, actually originally synthesized by ACD Bio. So for ERG, ETV1, ETV4, and ETV5, 
So these are the uh, mRNA with the all different exons in the number. And the bar uh, below shows the location of the RNA is probe. <clears throat> okay. So it is not that uh, you cannot take the whole gene uh, for making a probe. I think uh, ACD Bio, they have the algorithm that they will be able to um, kind of synthesize a gene-specific probe because the X uh, gene, they have about 27 gene family members. So there will be some high sequence homology. So in order to avoid any cross-hybridization of the probes, they will carefully select the regions and that will give a unique uh, probe for uh, each gene. So here, in order to evaluate, because since we were the one first doing this rna -ish for these gene fusions, we did uh, uh, our due diligence to show uh, that these probes are indeed, they are specific for uh, each gene. Like uh, <clears throat> in the top panel, the, like the ETV1 uh, probe, so we will see only the ETV1 positive case is actually strongly positive. But uh, <clears throat> the other, uh, like when you do the ETV4 and ETV5 on the same case, they are not showing positive. Because although these, uh, these genes are uh, kind of uh, a family of genes, they have uh, kind of related sequences. So we developed the probe <clears throat> that is specific for each gene. Okay, so that is the beauty. And uh, in the bottom, uh, you will see the ETV4 uh, probe is actually positive only in the ETV4 positive case, but it is negative in the ETV1 positive and ETV5 positive cases. So that clearly shows the specificity of this probe. So having evaluated this probe for the specificity, then we did uh, uh, some systematic uh, screening of prostate cancer. So if anyone wants to uh, kind of uh, um, uh, screen the prostate cancer for the presence or absence of the gene fusion, so you have to go in a systematic way. First to the pathology specimen, whether it's a needle biopsy or the radical prostatectomy samples, first to the pathologist will review uh, for the presence uh, or absence of cancer. So if it is benign, we don't have to do anything, but if it is a cancer, first, uh, depending on the size of the tumor, if there are atypical lesions or something like that, they will uh, combined with the AMAC or staining, just confirm it is cancer or some cytokinetin, um, like basal cell cocktail, like P63 and the high molecular weight cytokinetin. So that will rule out whether it is benign uh, or cancer. So once you rule out the specimen contains uh, cancer, then you can do a systematic characterization of these infusions. Depending upon the frequency of these markers, you know, the, since ERG is the most prevalent marker, first you can do the ERG ISC or the ERG FISH, you can do it, then followed by SPINK1, then you can do ETV1, ETV. So, so if you, so I think the main purpose of this slide is to show that if you want to screen all these markers individually, you'll be wasting a lot of slides, resources, time, and everything. Because sometimes when you have biopsy, you cannot afford that many slides as well. Okay, so uh, most of the time the biopsy tissue they may yield like a, not more than like five slides or something like that because that will be used for several other. Uh, you have to do H and E, then other markers and everything. So given the limitations of the available tissues, so you don't want to do this marker screening individually. So it is important that uh, you want to have a simultaneous evaluation of all these markers just by using a single slide. So I will show you how we did it. So this is uh, an example uh, to show the IHC and the rna -ish for individual markers. So I, we selected the needle biopsy samples from the kind of respective positive cases by ERK by doing IHC. We showed nice positive uh, signal. Then the SPINK1 IHC, also the tumor positive, then ETV1 rna -ish and the ETV4 RNA is, as you can see, the quality of the signal. The other beauty is the RNA is, you know, you are going to do only by bright field, you know, although you can do by fluorescence, but you can, uh, it is easy for the pathologist and the lab people to visualize the signal when you are seeing under bright field. So this is the biggest advantage. So we have uh, kind of standardized the probe performance for all these markers. Uh, on individual sections. <clears throat> so here again, I will show you another example in a large uh, kind of needle biopsy. 
there is a one small tumor fossa that is positive for ETV1. To see how specifically, you know, you can recognize the positivity, you don't see in the, uh, in, in the stromal area or the benign, you don't see any uh, kind of background or non-specific staining. So the probes are very specific. They will pick up each and every tumor cell. So the advantage of doing this is, you know, you can do some uh, automated uh, by using the digital images you can do some uh, automated quantitative analysis of the signal to get a, an idea of what percentage of cells are having these positive markers, okay? So this clearly shows the specificity. Because I'm showing all these things, you know, we are not, <clears throat> we did not just do this uh, assays on one type of tissue. We did on varieties of tissues. We did on the needle biopsy. And here I'm showing you on a tissue microarray. Here there are hundreds of samples here. By doing the ETV on RNAase, I clearly show that only there are uh, only three cases are positive for ETV1, and the rest of the cases are distinctly negative. So this clearly shows the specificity of the probes. You can easily, reliably, or categorically, you can pick up those positive cases without any issues. That shows the power of this approach. Then it is not only uh, the TMA or needle biopsy. So this is a patient-derived xenograft tissue. Where, which is an ETV1 positive tumor that was actually <clears throat> uh, implanted into the mouse and it is growing as a tumor. As you can see, only the human tissue that carrying the ETV1 to arrangement positive, it is showing strong positive, and then all the mouse tissue, it is not showing any staining at all. So it is not cross hybridizing with the mouse uh, gene on uh, ETV1 or anything like that. <clears throat> it shows the very highly specific probe that is uh, that will pick up only the gene of your interest. So these are the, some of the examples to show the specificity of the probe. So we already published this work. If anyone is interested, please go through this paper. You'll be able to get uh, more information about uh, how we did uh, the methods and everything, the procedure. So next, <clears throat> since we have uh, optimized uh, the conditions for the probe and uh, we standardized the conditions for both IHC and RNAH, so now I will show you how we identified some new molecular subset of prostate cancer by doing a dual color RNA ish and a dual color uh, IHC. Because I think traditionally people do like uh, only one marker at a time, then call it a day, it's a positive or negative. Because the prostate cancer is highly heterogeneous, uh, I think uh, I will show you some good examples, you will appreciate what I'm talking about. So here, what I'm showing is, uh, we, we were evaluating one of the cases that we know that is positive for uh, ETV1, okay? Uh, <clears throat> positive for initially, we confirmed by FISH because before uh, we do that, we don't have any uh, rna ish method or no antibody. So we confirmed by FISH and PCR that this case is positive for ETV1. So then we, when we did the ETV1 rna ish so all the red color staining is the ETV1 expression, as you can see. But there are uh, two areas that is circled there. Uh, they are still cancer, but they are not positive for ETV1. So that really puzzled me. So initially, I was challenging my technicians. So it could be some air bubbles on the slide. That's why the probe didn't reach that area. But uh, I asked uh, the technician to repeat again, and again, we got the same result. So that gave me some idea what is really going on. So this is uh, this clearly shows the tumor heterogeneity. You know, one area is positive for ETV1, and there are areas that are negative. So out of curiosity, what I did, I did the uh, ERG uh, immunohistochemistry uh, on the same uh, on a, another consecutive slide. So what interestingly, what I found was the area that is negative for ETV1 now they are actually positive for ERG. Okay. So since because I selected ERG because ERG is the other prevalent marker. So when I did ERG, so that area is positive for ERG, and immediately area next to that was positive for uh, uh, ATV1. So this is the zoom in view of the ERG. And also we did FISH uh, to confirm that uh, these different uh, <clears throat> foci in this tumor are positive. One is positive, this is positive for ERG, and the other area is positive for ETV1. So this is the first time that we were able to show um, uh, that uh, you can have this, uh, what is called the intratumor heterogeneity. Like one area is positive for one marker, other one area is positive for one marker. So if you 
kind of close the analysis just by doing only one marker, then you will be missing an important information. So that is the powerful approach by combining both IHC and RNAs. This was the first time we were able to show that the simultaneous uh, evaluation of both ETB1 and ERG gene fusion on the same case. So here is another example. There is a small area, high-grade pin that is positive for ERG, and immediately right next to that, the adjacent uh, area, uh, it is positive uh, for uh, ETB1. There is an RNA, you know, the very next foci. So there is no uh, kind of overlap. So they are uh, adjacent, but you will see the distinct uh, the molecular feature. This uh, foci is positive for ERK, and the one next to it is positive for ETB1. So there are two different kind of mutation occurring in the same patient in two distinct foci. So this is the important information. For the first time, we were able to do it. And there is another case also, here also another example. There is a large area that is positive for ETV1, and at the bottom, there is a small area that is positive for ERG, but still there is a third foci, very at the bottom, still it is negative both for ERG and ETV1. So it could be something else going on, okay? So we don't know what it is going on because we screened the other market, they are not positive. So it could be some new mutations that is yet to be discovered or uh, some new gene fusion is not. So, so this clearly tells the enormous, uh, <clears throat> the tumor heterogeneity, the inter and intra tumor heterogeneity, which you can actually resolve by doing this combined IHC and rna -ish, okay? Okay, so that is uh, <clears throat> the application of uh, IHC and rna -ish. The next, we because so far we did uh, uh, this uh, IHC and RNA is uh, on the selected tumor foci. Like when you have a radical prostatectomy or needle biopsy, you know you are taking only one tumor foci and doing all the analysis. So now I will show you, without any kind of tumor selection bias, how you can actually understand this tumor molecular heterogeneity by doing this IHC and RNA is. So here I will show you. Uh, because I showed you we can do both uh, needle biopsy and uh, the radical prostatectomy and the tissue microarray. But what we know is more than about uh, 80 to 90 percent of the prostate cancer are multifocal disease, meaning that there is more than one tumor foci that you will find in the prostate gland. Okay? So if you are doing uh, the radical prostatectomy or needle biopsy, you will be able to sample only one tumor, right? And uh, and I think the prevailing thought is about uh, you always look for the large tumor and high gleason grade, and people thought that those are the ones that are driving the progression of the disease. But now eventually that idea is uh, kind of changing. Now people are looking at both the dominant or the index foci and also all the secondary foci, and they are giving a combined gleason score like that. So for that reason, what we did, instead of kind of selecting a particular tumor foci, we wanted to evaluate the entire kind of the prostate without selecting any particular area, okay? So, so here, uh, I will explain why we are doing that. Because as you know, the prostate cancer development is a kind of 10 or 20 year process. So initially, you know, you will see some high-grade pain or something like that developing. Then, so, then slowly, you will see the, the tumors of uh, different grades are existing within the prostate. Okay, so when you see these kind of multifocal, both uh, from low-grade tumor to high-grade tumor, what is the relationship between this tumor within the prostate gland? When you have a multifocal because like I said, there are 90% of the prostate are like that, okay? You don't find a single tumor foci. Most of the time, you will find more than one tumor foci. In such a situations, are these tumor foci are genetically identical? Or in other words, do they carry the same mutation or not? This is the fundamental question that uh, we wanted to answer. So for, for that, uh, this technology is really helpful. Because before I show that, I will show an example. So this is a study that people have done both by fish and uh, next generation sequencing by selecting uh, tumors from different uh, locations of the prostate and they did to some extent the sequencing 
and they are able to kind of generate this phylogenetic tree where there will be some commonality in all the tumors in terms of aberrations. But as the tumor progresses, you will see subclonal population. They will carry some unique aberrations like that. So this is how the tumors are branching out. It starts from one and you will see that. So when you do uh, this type of analysis by doing the next gen sequencing or everything, you are going to just crush the tumor, take everything, and you are going to uh, give a more uh, kind of a global analysis. But that is not going to really help. Okay? So what we did was uh, we just preserved the tissue uh, as it is. Okay? So first, uh, this is the study that we published. Initially, what we did here, we took some needle biopsy samples. So in a needle biopsy, you will see in the long core, one end there will be a tumor foci, in the other end there will be a tumor foci, in between is the stroma or benign tissue. So when you see this kind of tumor, two tumor foci, we ask the question uh, to, uh, to whether these two tumor foci are the same. So what we found, uh, there are more than uh, about, uh, <clears throat> about 29 or 30 percent uh, of these, what is called discontinuous foci, what we call it, okay? Uh, discontinuous means these tumor foci are not connected because either we don't know whether it is like in the figure and <clears throat> A and B, as you can see, whether they are coming from the same foci or from two different foci when you take the needle biopsy. So that's the reason we wanted to do this study. What we found was there are more than about 30 percent of these uh, uh, discontinuous needle biopsy specimens carry like one foci is positive for ERG, other foci is positive for ERG. Uh, sorry, other foci for spink one or one is negative or other one is positive or one marker like that. So we clearly demonstrated this type of heterogeneity using the needle biopsy specimen. So then we extended the study. So here is another example to show the discontinuous foci. So you have the in between, the benign, and the top there is a ETV1 and the bottom there another tumor foci that is earth. That clearly shows because when you look at the Gleason grade, they both are kind of identical. You may like call it Gleason 6 like that, but at the molecular level, they are completely different. So this is a very important information that we are learning by doing both IHC and RNAs. Suppose if you do only one marker, since ERG is present in 50% of the cancer, here you are going to see only one foci that is positive for ERG, the other foci you call it negative, you don't know what is going on. So just by doing both IS and RNAs, we were able to show this uh, intertumor heterogeneity. So given this uh, type of uh, kind of um, tumor heterogeneity in, in the discontinuous foci, what we did, so evaluation of just one marker or two marker is not sufficient. Since we know that ERG is there, SPINK1, ETV1, ETV4, this account for about 60% of the prostate cancer, what we did was we want to combine all the four in one experiment, okay? So that we, we want to uh, analyze uh, the simultaneous uh, expression of all these four, if at all they are expressed, okay? So what we did was, for as, we, as I told you before, the ergon spring one, we have a good antibody, so we developed the dual IHC. So the ERG will be detected with the green <coughs> chromogen and the spring one with the blue chromogen. And the ETV1, you can do it in brown and ETV4 in red color. This is RNA-ish. So you can do both RNA-ish and IHC on the same slide, okay? But of course, you'll be doing in a sequential manner. You cannot do all both IH and RNAs at the same time. Like I said before, first you do the RNA-ish, then you do the IHC. <clears throat> but RNA-ish, either you can do it as a single probe or a dual probe, okay? Uh, this is what we did. So here, clearly, I'm showing an example. So this is a tissue microarray that we constructed, uh, putting all the uh, positive cases, like uh, ERG positive, SPINK positive, ETV1 positive, ETV4 positive, then some fusion negative cases. So this is a TMA that we constructed purposely for this study. So when we did both IHC and RNAs, that is two marker IHC and two marker uh, RNAs, we were able to show on the same, in a single, uh, slide all the four markers, like in the top, the, there is an ETV4 positive tumor, then the next to that is a SPINK1 positive tumor, and in the bottom, in the middle, you have the ERG positive tumor, and in the bottom, you have the ETV1 positive tumor. So this is the beauty. Uh, of the one good thing in uh, of all these markers is 
if the tumor is positive uh, one tumor if it is positive for a particular mutation you don't see a second gene fusion in the same foci it may be in a different foci on the same prostate gland but not within the foci you don't see a second mutation so so these are all kind of mutually exclusive these markers that's how they express so it is easy for us to detect and other important thing is as i told you before since these genes are expressed only when they undergo chromosome translocations so there is no endogenous level of expression of this they, they don't express in benign at all so you can clearly see the differential uh, we are not looking for a differential expression of these markers but like i said before if you are working on other uh, solid cancers if you are uh, if you if you are looking for a differential expression like a uh, low in benign or high uh, in tumor or low in tumor or high in benign like that so when there is a differential there there you, you can easily quantitate it as well so that is not a uh, really challenging <clears throat> so uh, so what we did there is not only just uh, that tma so this is the another large tma okay so that, so the, because that tma was constructed for that purpose but this is a uh, entirely new tma that we got from our collaborator and we did this four color uh, um, ihc and rna ish and we were able to identify this distinct positive cases where i will show you a little uh, zoom in view see this this is the erg positive cases the erg is positive only in the tumor and this is the spink one that is a cytoplasmic staining then this is the etv one again because since we are doing so you may be wondering why you are seeing this green color in between right so these greens are basically the erg antibody it is not only staining the prostate tumor but it is also expressed in the endothelial cells so that uh, serves as an internal control for this antibody so that's why even in the since we did both ihc and rna is on the same slide so even in the after we did even though this tumor is positive for etv1 you will see some erg staining in between on the endothelial cells as well and similarly for etv4 as well <clears throat> okay so so that is the reason you will see some uh, green spots <clears throat> so when the tumor is negative clearly for erg etv1 etv4 is completely negative and only you see the endothelial staining of the erg only the green so this is a very perfect example of how specific uh, these antibodies and the rna probes are you know they detect only the positive cases and you are not uh, doing dealing with any false positive or false negative cases okay so now using this um, approach so like i showed you before either you can do it on needle biopsy or radical prostatectomy sample uh, using a selected tumor or a tissue microarray because those are all heavily biased you are selecting some uh, tumor of interest okay so uh, given this enormous heterogeneity in a multifocal cancer what we did we don't want to do any kind of uh, tumor selection bias all right so we want to evaluate uh, the tumor heterogeneity in situ as it is by using the whole mount radical prostatectomy specimens meaning that the entire prostate is actually fixed in a block by using a 3 by 2 slide we will be able to section the prostate gland and even put it on a large glass slide this is not the standard microscope slide so this is the double the size of the standard microscope slide it's a large microscope slide you will be able to mount the entire prostate on a glass slide then you can do this in situ analysis so here i'm showing this example so this is the entire prostate <clears throat> and the gap in the middle is the urethra and all those things so in one area you will see there is a tumor here that is positive for erg then other area in this large square there is a tumor but interestingly what we found was uh, when you look at the morphology or the hn e they all look the same like a gleason 6 something like that but when we did this uh, ihc and rna ish on the same slide what we found was one portion of this uh, section on the left side is completely positive for earth and on the right side is positive for etv1 so this clearly shows that these are two different tumors and they are colliding tumors okay so they are evolved independently since they are expanding they look like they are merging together uh, under hn e they are going to look like one tumor but when we did this molecular analysis we were able to separate okay these tumors into distinct molecular subtypes so that is the power of this approach uh, you will be able to evaluate uh, the tumor heterogeneity um, by using this known cancer specific markers uh, <clears throat> the next one this is another interesting case where there are five tumors Uh, in which the large index foci is at the bottom which is completely negative 
But when we did the ERG, ETB1, and SPRINC1, three markets, what we found was like one tumor is positive for ERG, other one is positive for SPRINC1, then the third one is positive for ETB1. Okay? So there are three markets that are present in the one prostate. Okay? So this is the very powerful uh, kind of information that we were able to get for prostate. The first time we clearly show this enormous tumor heterogeneity. Suppose, uh, you know, if you are going to make clinical decision just by looking at only the dominant or the index foci, you are going to completely miss all these positive tumor foci here. Okay? So the patient is not going to get the real benefit. Suppose if there is a drug or something is available for ERG or SPRINC1, something like that, so you are not going to treat this patient. You are going to get completely a false and negative result uh, based on the analysis of the index foci by missing all the ERG, SPRINC1, and ETB1 like that. So this is the first time we clearly show this uh, extent of this uh, tumor uh, molecular heterogeneity in a multifocal tumor. So I'm sure you are convinced that how powerful this combined IHC and RNAs approach is useful to studying the tumor heterogeneity. So this is not just for prostate cancer. If anyone is interested, if you have different markers, you can develop this approach for other cancer as well. I think already people are working on, on the PD-1 markers, you know, they are showing heterogeneity, then the HER2 markers, you know. So you can combine with additional markers to show what exactly is going on. So this is the, <clears throat> because, Although the ERG and ETV1 are the same AIDS family gene fusions, but uh, what we found was, based on the recent literature, they function at the molecular level entirely differently, okay? So the ERG and ETV1, they control a common transcriptional network by largely in an opposing fashion, okay? So although they are the gene, same gene family, but they are functionally, they are totally different. Like ERG is negatively regulating the androgen receptor transcriptional program, but whereas ETV1, it actually cooperates with AR signaling by favoring activation of AR transcriptional program. These are some of the papers that are published. So then also people have shown that ETV1 expression, but not the of ERG, promotes uh, autonomous uh, testosterone production. And the ETV1, but not ERK, upregulates expression of AI target genes as well as genes involved in steroid biosynthesis and metabolism. So ETV1 supports the development of invasive adenocarcinoma under the background of uh, full PET and loss. So like that, there is a distinct biology that are associated. So in the prostate, one tumor for say has ETV1, other is can ERK1, and they are functioning in an opposite way. They make the cancer is much more aggressive or the patient may have a more aggressive disease or a bad prognosis like that. So evaluating these tumors, although we don't have drug, there is no direct clinical use for these markers, but I think using these markers, when by studying this heterogeneity, we will be able to understand the, the outcome or the risk factors uh, for the prostate in a much better way. I think for that reason, when we combine this both IAC and RNA ish, you know, that will be a powerful approach since we can do both on the needle biopsy and on the hormone specimens, we will have a better understanding of the tumor prognosis. So next quickly I will show you um, the uh, how we can uh, do RNAs for non-coding RNA. As you know that there are many non-coding RNAs recently emerging as a potential kind of biomarkers for cancer. Like several, they have uh, some known functions. They can uh, function as a kind of gene regulator molecules. They can uh, work as a protein inhibition or the post-transcriptional uh, modifiers or decoy elements like that, you know. So that's why since we don't have an antibody or we cannot, since they are not coding for any protein, so if we want to evaluate the tissue level expression of non-coding RNAs, I think RNA is, RNA is the best uh, method for uh, evaluation of the expression of <clears throat> uh, this non-coding RNA. So here I'm showing an example of PCA3, which is a prostate-specific non-coding RNA that is uh, known to be highly expressed in about uh, 90 or 95 percent of the cases. And uh, there is a urine test uh, that is uh, FDA approved. It's called a Progensa. There is a um, uh, urine test is available that is FDA approved and the people are using it, combining with the ERG and PCA3 and the PSA level, they can actually predict uh, for the presence of cancer by non-invasive methods, just by because TMPRSS to ERG you can detect in the urine, 
and PCA3 also uh, you can do it in the urine then uh, <clears throat> you can uh, do the serum PSA so everything without even taking the biopsy by combining both the ERG PSA and PCA3 you can come up with a score and uh, that will predict uh, whether you are going to see a cancer when you do the biopsy or re-biopsy like that so even when uh, when the biopsy is negative for the first time when you do this type of analysis because one marker is not absolute because these markers are representing only a small percentage of the cases like ERG is present only in 50 percent PCA3 more than 90 percent of cases then PSA is always elevated in the tumor cases by combining all these three you will be able to come up with a reliable diagnosis whether the patient has a advanced cancer or not okay so in that uh, reason so we did a study uh, showing whether uh, the urine since PCA3 can be evaluated in the urine so we did a study uh, assessing uh, whether there is a correlation between the tissue level expression of PCA3 uh, and uh, the same cases matching urine as well so there is a good concordance <clears throat> there um, so I think given the time I will uh, quickly I cannot I don't have time to go through that on the PCA3 so like I said the PCA3 is a good marker uh, more than 90 percent of the prostate has this marker there is a progenza urine test is available so what we did was for the first time by using the RNA-ish because before our work people have used some radioactive probe for the PCA3 and they showed the tissue level expression but this we were the one first uh, for the first time by using the ACD bio RNA probe we showed that the expression of the PCA3 either in a kind of small area of the prostate or you will see the entire prostate may be positive for the PCA3 as you can see almost every tumor area in this sample is positive for PCA3 okay so this is how we can actually evaluate the tissue level expression of the PCA I think this for the first time you know we showed the tissue level expression so we published this paper if anyone is interested please go through this paper here we show <coughs> the concordance of PCA3 expression both in the tissue and the urine level this is the first time that we showed there and the next I will quickly show you uh, the DNA and the RNA uh, DNA equation the RNA is on the same slide okay here just one example so the DNA and the I think the green color signals are using a DNA probe for a particular gene of our interest then we use the RNA probe uh, so on the on, on the right side you will see those uh, pink dots uh, where the RNA is expressed so in the same cell so our goal was since we if we use the DNA probe whether the RNA is also expressed uh, because uh, we know that this RNA uh, this is more like it has a function of a DNA binding uh, for gene regulation so the main purpose of this experiment to see whether the gene locus uh, identified by the DNA fish and uh, we asked the question whether the RNA is functioning at the same foci, uh, same locus or in a different locus what we found was the DNA copy number is intact but the RNA is actually functioning in a different uh, location in the DNA uh, in, the, in the genome like that so so what I'm showing is here you can do both uh, IHC sorry the DNA fish and the RNA fish on the same slide to evaluate uh, the status of the DNA copy number and the RNA level for the gene of interest so this is a very powerful uh, approach that uh, anyone can uh, use it and it is not only like I said it's not just for prostate cancer or anything like that so we published a paper uh, for some of the sarcomas where we have uh, some of the known genes like the Ed's family genes are also rearranged in the sarcomas so we did some study on the sarcomas as well and uh, by using the RNA is we were able to detect uh, some of the um, virus as well it is called a Merkel cell carcinoma <coughs> samples we were able to show the positive uh, uh, for some viral uh, probe that we used and we were able to show it so the application is uh, broad you know by using the RNA is and if necessary you can combine with IHC as well okay so this is the power of both IHC and RNA is so in summary I showed you an overview of you know uh, what are the applications of RNA is and the IHC how you can combine both IHC and RNA is for the simultaneous evaluation of up to four markers I think uh, now I think this is the limit of this technology right now I'm sure uh, the technology is evolving 
they will be able to because the limitation is the availability of the chromogens okay if we have more this chromogens are available we will be able to add more markers i am sure the company is working towards that to making it more uh, multiplex so at this point i clearly show the application of combined ihc and rnas how you can actually detect <clears throat> the S gene fusions in prostate cancer, and we identified new subset of prostate cancer where more than one gene fusion present in the same tumor foci. And um, then also, uh, I showed you that uh, we can analyze different type of samples: uh, needle biopsy, radical prostatectomy, tissue microarray and patient-derived xenograft tissues. You know, you can use any type of tissues. In fact, I forgot to use here. If you have a fresh frozen tissue, fresh frozen tissue. Uh, we can do RNA-ish on the fresh frozen tissue as well. So this, there is no limitation, okay? So once it is fixed in formalin, the fresh frozen tissue, or if you have a touch prop, you know, I think that is something that the pathologist or the clinician, they may want to get some quick results. If they want to <clears throat> see the results, if you have a touch prop specimen, you can do RNA-ish on that as well. Uh, because RNA-ish procedure is, you will get the results on the same day. If you start in the morning, by, an, by early afternoon, you will be able to get the results. You don't have to, there is no overnight incubation or anything like that. If you have the slide, start in the morning and uh, by evening you will get it uh, by manual method and also I think automated method is well, uh, like less than five hours or something like that. So on the same day, you will be able to get the results. So this is a very powerful uh, kind of technology uh, that is that can be widely used in all different type of tissues. I hope I convinced you uh, by showing uh, the application of combined IH in the RNA is. So with that, I would like to thank uh, the entire team of uh, clinicians, uh, pathologists, and the lab people who have been uh, <clears throat> very helpful uh, in setting up this technology. And I think recently we have published several papers. Uh, you can search uh, with, with my last name and you will be able to find some important papers that we published both in modern pathology <clears throat> and the clinical cancer research and other journals as well. So with that, I would like to thank you uh, for your attention and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jasper Palasami. That was an excellent presentation. Really appreciate you taking the time to um, go through in so much detail. That was really wonderful. Um, here's an opportunity if you have not yet asked any questions, if you have any questions for Dr. Nala, please do pop them into the chat. Um, in the meantime, I have a, do have a couple of questions lined up for you uh, that we can go ahead with. Um, Dr. Nala, what are the advantages of using RNA in situ hybridization over IHC? Yes, as I mentioned in my presentation, <clears throat> RNA is, is not uh, a technique to replace IHC. RNA is a unique uh, and technology that uh, can be used <clears throat> uh, for the genes of interest <clears throat> for which you don't have a good antibody. So even though there are some antibodies available for some of the genes, like different winters have different antibodies and they may have a different uh, kind of sensitivity and specificity, and they may have some cross reactivity and all those issues. Uh, in those in their situations, RNA is the best uh, method uh, to overcome all those issues because RNA is is a sequence-based hybridization. <clears throat> so you will not get any non-specific or off-target uh, signals. The signals will be very specific, <clears throat> and also uh, the way uh, the RNA is works is actually you know it will hybridize only to the gene of interest and you do not see any off-target or non-specific signals. So it is for that reason uh, for the genes for which if the, even if the antibody is available, if the different antibody performance are quite variable, you can actually uh, cross-validate your IHC data using RNAs. That is one application. And for genes for which if you don't have any antibody, and if you are interested in studying the expression of this gene at the tissue level, RNA is the method of choice uh, for the protein coding genes as well. And like I said, <clears throat> the now the non-coding RNAs and the pseudogenes, these are the new molecular uh, markers that are evolving and uh, their role uh, in cancer is well established. So in order to study the tissue level expression of these non-coding RNA molecules, 
RNA is the only option right now for the institute detection, although you can do PCR, next-gen sequencing, and all those things. Because as I, uh, as I showed you, because of this enormous tissue level inter- and intratumor heterogeneity, if you want to see where these molecules are expressed within a tumor, because you are not expecting them to express in all the tissues, if you want to see the tissue specific, or um, uh, then you want to um, <clears throat> combine with the morphological features, I think RNA is the best method. The other main advantage is, you know, you can do RNA is under the bright field method. Okay, so that is the beauty of it. Like IHC, you can visualize uh, the results under bright field. <clears throat> of course, uh, there is an option to do fluorescence as well, but uh, I think most of the time, I think, uh, I think bright field is the best approach because you are preserving the tissue morphology. You can have the counter stain like a H and E, so you can uh, you can relate the of your expression results with the tissue morphology. What type of mor tissue morphology that you are seeing? So I think I think these are some of the uh, advantages uh, of uh, using uh, RNA uh, over IHC. So each one has its unique advantages. I'm I'm not saying that RNA is replacing IHC. You can uh, still have uh, IHC where if you, as long as you have a fully validated and a highly specific antibody that can be still used, then in place, if you want to study additional markers, you can put RNAs for that. Like, I think that reason, I think both uh, techniques are complementary, but RNA is, is really uh, kind of sequence specific, and I think the sensitivity and specificity are much higher. For that reason, you know, uh, um, I recommend uh, using <coughs> RNA is if you have issues with uh, any of the antibody that is available for any of the known genes. Yeah, thank you for the question. Great, thank you very much. That was that was really good. Um, okay, I do have another one here. Um, can RNA ish be performed along with DNA fish? Yes, uh, like I showed you uh, in the last slide, I think that is the other uh, important development uh, in this field because uh, fish, as you know, that is a quite popular method and the people are using it uh, for uh, for detecting DNA amplifications, deletions, translocations, and small inserts and deletions and all those things. So when you do just the DNA, you will get only uh, limited information. Suppose if you're dealing with an amplification of a particular gene, Although it, it doesn't necessarily mean that when a DNA level copy number is increased, it doesn't necessarily mean that the gene within that amplicon is also highly expressed at the RNA level. So in order to answer that question, if you, ha if you have a small focal amplicon where there are four or five genes within the amplicon, for example, so if you want to know what are the kind of, uh, what is the expression pattern of the genes involved within the amplicon, so in that situation, you will be able to have a multicolor DNA fish. So like you know, the DNA fish can be done with the three or four colors like that. You can do multicolor DNA fish. Then on the same slide, you can do the RNA yes, because RNA uh, signal is going to be uh, look entirely different like the DNA fish, and you are capturing in different layers. So you will be able to simultaneously visualize both the DNA copy number and uh, RNA expression. So that is the power of this. So I think that is the new development of this. R Originally, RNA is, was developed as such, but there are new development associated developments that is coming up with that. So yes, uh, to answer the questions, we can do both DNA fish and RNA ish. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And yes, we do have a number of new items in the pipeline. So do watch this space for more information on that. Thank you very much, Dr. Nala. That was an excellent overview of using ISH and IHC together combined. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak today. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you all. Please uh, email me if you have any questions. I'll be happy to answer or I'll be happy to help you if you are setting up uh, this RNAs procedure uh, in your lab. Either you can contact me or the technical support from the ACD Bio company. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. And if you do, if we do, weren't able to get to your questions offline, please do continue to pop them in the chat and we'll be reaching out to Dr. Nala independently of today's session. And we'll make sure that we connect you and you get the answers that you need. Thank you very much.